This week at the movies, from Tim Burton and Johnny Depp, it's a 3D trip down the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland. And we've got your first look. <laughs> also coming up this week... Now that is what I'm talking about. Bruce Willis and Tracy Morgan are on the hunt for a couple of no. laughs and a baseball card thief in Cop Out. Military started shooting town folk. Ah, we gotta get out of here. What did a nice state like what Iowa do says. to deserve a horrifying biological disaster? It's the Pitchfork Sharp remake of the horror film The Crazies. Plus, will Avatar really take the biggest prize at the Academy Awards next weekend? Guess correctly, and you have a chance to win some great prizes of your own if you can outpick the critics. There is a place like no place on earth. Some say to survive it, you need to be as mad as a hatter, which luckily I am Alice. Johnny Depp and Tim Burton team up for the sixth time in Alice in Wonderland. I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm A.O. Scott of the New York Times. First up is Alice in Wonderland, and it opens next week. We have the first good look at the latest adaptation of the Lewis Carroll classic, along with Sweeney Todd. The new Disney 3D Alice is director Tim Burton's most interesting film in a decade. The idea here is that Alice has visited Wonderland as a young girl, either in her dreams or in actuality. We pick up Alice at age 19 when she's to be engaged, but she spies a white rabbit and zoop down the rabbit hole goes Alice, and soon it's time for tea. You're absolutely Alice. I'd know you anywhere. I'd know him anywhere. <laughs> well. As you can see, we're still having tea. And it's all because I was obliged to kill time waiting for your return. You're terribly late, you know. Naughty. That's Johnny Depp as the lisping Mad Hatter, adding another eccentric to his Tim Burton gallery of eccentrics. The Red Queen has run roughshod over the place known as Underland. Helena Bonham Carter, with an enlarged noggin, plays the Red Queen. And here she meets Alice for the first time. What happened to your clothes? I outgrew them. I've been growing an awful lot lately. I tower over everyone in Umbridge. They laugh at me. So I've come to you hoping you might understand what it's like. My dear girl, anyone with a head that large is welcome in my court. This movie has little interest in preteen skewing comedy, but Burton has found exactly the right leading player, Mia Wasikowska as Alice. From the moment I fell down that rabbit hole, I've been told what I must do and who I must be. This is my path. I'll decide where it goes from here. Burton was charged here with delivering unto Walt Disney Pictures a big-budget 3D enterprise with some semblance of cinematic personality, and that he has done. Now, despite what the trailers are telling you, this is a thoughtful, rather sinister, and often dazzling spectacle, and while it won't be for all tastes, and it shouldn't preclude anybody from reading the books, I say, see it. You? Yeah, I liked it. I mean, I, I liked it especially for the Tim Burton aspects of it, which is to say the, the visual inventiveness, the, the, the odd creatures and characters that populate this, this dream world. And mm -hmm. I think he used the performers, some of his kind of his stock company, if you want, Helena Bonham Carter and, and Johnny Depp, to very good effect. And, and I think he also uses 3D. I mean, this is not an, an in-your-face, flying-off-the-screen 3D spectacle. But no, no. But he does use it to kind of to deepen the field a little bit and, and make this world seem a little a little more kind of full and, and detailed and strange. Right. I think this is one of the few adaptations of a, of a often-filmed classic that when, you, when you're looking at all the backstory and yeah. framing devices added by the screenwriter in this case, most of it actually really helps the story. I think the whole prelude where you, where you see the vic this sort of stultifying Victorian life that young Alice is trying to get away from, uh, that actually works and supports yes. everybody's experience of the film. There's a line in the, in the book about Alice's muchness, and that's right. also in the film. And it, I think the film's kind of a, a war between Alice's muchness and Tim Burton's too muchness. Do you know I, what I mean? Well, I think more it's, it's a war between Tim Burton's eccentricity and the kind of the, the some of the standard you know, motifs and conventions of the kids' fantasy action movies. So when they get down into this underworld place, right. underland, um, you have, you know, Crispin Glover and, uh, and Helena Bonham Carter are, you know, the bad guys, and, and Anne Hathaway is the good guy. And you have what felt to me like a very familiar battle between good and evil, climaxing in a big battle sequence with this huge Jabberwock and, monster. And, and, and Tim like Burton is not good at that. Imaginative yeah, exactly. part of the movie it's, it's like me. Tim Burton taking on Planet of the Apes. He had no real facility for that stuff. And I agree, that's the weak stuff in it. But I think, I think what you have is you have a good performance 
sequence yes. right at the middle of it, and that it kind of cuts through a lot of the potential excess, and it, it keeps you through it. It does, yeah. and, and it has, at its best, I think, a sort of a quiet, creepy, yes. funny, slightly grotesque, maybe for some young kids somewhat Too disturbing much, yeah, I, Older mood, kids, older but, kids, uh, understand, yeah. But a really, a really interesting Yeah, good. Movie. I liked it better than Charlie and Chocolate Factory, too. Nice. Yeah, me too. Okay, next movie. Remember 48 Hours? How about Beverly Hills Cop? How about Tango and Cash, The Last Boy Scout? How about Turner and Hooch? Well, if you don't remember those, no problem. Cop Out remembers everything about them. It's an attempt by Bruce Willis, Tracy Morgan, and director Kevin Smith to re-energize the buddy cop movie. Willis and Morgan play Jimmy and Paul, longtime New York detectives on the hunt for Latino gangsters and a missing baseball card. First up, the interrogation scene where Motormouth Paul runs through a slew of movie catchphrases. Now he's doing Al Pacino from Heat. I got the death penalty in 12 systems! Star Wars? Tell us about the chicken. Schindler's List? We're gonna need a bigger pool. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice! Everything on cable TV. Yeah, it's your call yeah. whether that dialogue is funny enough. Here, a botched sting operation lands the Brooklyn-based detectives in trouble. There's a right way of doing police work. There's a wrong way of doing it. Then there's a way that you two idiots do it. The good news, Captain? We're fine. The good news is you're suspended. 30 days without pay. What? Suspended without pay. Now, the movie knows we've heard that speech before, but that doesn't make it any more interesting here. Jimmy's stolen baseball card is the key for paying for his daughter's $50,000 wedding. Director Smith, though, is more interested in detours like this encounter with a car thief. Whose car is this? Your mama's. What? You are an angry young man. Tell us about the stolen Mercedes Benz. I'm not telling you nothing. No, you're going to tell me something, or I'm going to go. The crowd I saw this movie with was eerily silent through most of it. I mean, stoic. You know who does earn his paycheck here, though? The composer, Harold Faltermeyer, whose very 80s synthesizer score will put you in mind of the Beverly Hills Cop theme because he wrote that, too. The rest of this movie, skip it. In fact, arrested for vagrancy. Tony, a tough sit. Skip it and, and, and arrested for, for brazen and uninspired theft of <laughs> yes, all of yes, the movies yes. that, that you named and many, many, many more. I mean, this didn't even feel like a movie to me. This felt like a blooper reel that went on for nearly two hours <laughs> and that I hadn't seen the, the, the movie that it was attached to. Right, I mean, okay, okay. So now, now here's, the, here's the thing. You think back to the first Beverly Hills Cop film, sure. the 48 Hours, those, yeah. those two pictures really had a very clever mixture, just about half and half, of straight action mm -hmm. and wisecracking comedy, with, with the common denominator being Eddie Murphy. Those films and the sequels to those films, the difference in quality yeah. between the sequels and the original, you know, vast, well, and it makes you realize how difficult that kind of thing is to pull off. And how much it depends on, on good writing and direction, because I think actually that, you know, Tracy Morgan is a funny and, and interesting and lively performer. Certainly and, is on 30 and, Rock. And, yeah. yeah, he is. And, and Bruce Willis certainly, you know, can, can do some great sort of glowering, tough yeah. guy things, but Kevin Smith, is, I think, is so far out of his comfort zone here. I mean, yes. this is, is sort of a, a studio work for hire that he that he did to show that he could do a genre movie and collect a paycheck, but right. he's much better at just sort of observing people, you know, talking and wisecracking and telling off-color jokes. Here, you know, the story keeps getting in the way of terrible. itself. And, it's, and, it's, and, and the, the script the, the is tone, terrible. The tone is a disaster. I yep. mean, it's so childish and immature and yet so brutal and grisly and violent right. at the right. same time it does not find any sort Again, of Again, you know, for every Beverly Hills cop in 48 hours, you get one of these, and it's it's a bad trade. Yeah, one is too many. <laughs> Coming up next, don't worry, it's just a little virus that could lead to the end of the world. We diagnose the new bio-thriller, The Crazies. And later on, The Hurt Locker and Avatar are the front runners in the Best Picture race, but could The Blind Side or Inglorious Bastards pull an upset? Get ready to outpick the critics. We're going to build the perfect fort. We can have a big swimming pool and a trampoline. <laughs> take care of each other and we'll all sleep together in a real pile where the wild things are on blu-ray combo pack and dvd what there's somebody outside our next movie takes place in a quiet little all-american town which should be your first clue that something is going to go terribly wrong, if the fact that the movie is called The Crazies hadn't already tipped you off. And for fans of the horror genre, or for fans who gave up on it long ago, this is a movie to check out. A mysterious disease is making some of the locals act, well, crazy. And this causes some irritation for the local sheriff, who's played by Timothy Oliphant. Oh, is he dead? Well, if he 
his, he won't mind waiting. That scene, with its mixture of grisly horror and dark, deadpan humor, captures what's best about this jumpy little remake of a 1973 cult classic. The virus is bad enough, but the brutal, almost genocidal response of the U.S. military is even worse. I'm a sheriff. She's a doctor. We know these people. What is going on here? Would you just tell us what's going on? Maybe we can actually help you. So the sheriff and his pregnant wife, a doctor played by Rada Mitchell, find themselves fleeing not only their crazed fellow citizens, but also ruthless soldiers. And this gives the director, Breck Eisner, a chance to stage some nifty, gruesome set pieces, like this ride through the car wash of terror. Come on! Let's go! All right! Come on, let's go! Why are we moving? Don't be moving, shit! I can't get any traction. <laughs> That's sure to be a theme park ride someday. <laughs> the killer virus genre is often a vehicle for real-world anxieties, and the crazies will give hunters after hidden meanings plenty to chew on. But it never loses sight of its main purpose, which is to offer scares, surprises, and an occasional horrified laugh. It's kind of crazy, but it's also pretty smart. And if your nervous system can stand it, you should see it. I should see it too, Tony. This is one of the Good nicest, movie. yeah, one of the nicest, bloodiest surprises <laughs> of 2010. I think this is the kind of B movie that really does give you faith in that kind of level of filmmaking, right? Absolutely. Low budget, high yeah. invention. You know, definitely high gore, no question. But you mentioned the car wash scene of. Oh my God. I, you know, that's great. I can finally check that off my list of scenes I never thought I'd see. A really frightening scene set in a car wash that ends with the right kind of laugh, too. Exactly. And that, well, and that proves everything's working on this film. Yes. I no, the, I mean, the, the, the craft is very good here. Very smart, very tight. The right. way that... Eisner goes from, you know, these, these horrifying, you know, really scary, the, the very first episode where this, this guy, the town drunk, shows up in the middle of a high school baseball game whoa, 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 with a shotgun. And, 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 and that seems to play very seriously. Very yeah, seriously yeah. and very unnerving. And then, you know, a few scenes later, you have um, Timothy Oliphant, you know, and this, this runaway bone saw chasing him across <laughs> the, the, in the room the of the office. local morgue. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's all scene. done so well. The timing, the, the, the way that the story kind yep. of unfolds, you never know quite what's yep. going on. It yep. skips the obligatory, now we're going to explain to you exactly what is happening. Scene. Yeah, no, that that, never no, none of that. Who needs exposition at this point in our right. lives? I don't think, <laughs> but it's the right speed, it's the right weight, you know, it's in the right weight class. It's not trying to be more than it is, and it's better than the George Romero original. So, you know, I, I say see it all the way. Coming up next, an HD TV and Blu-ray player are on the line. Can you outpick the critics? And on next week's show, Richard Gere, Wesley Snipes, Ethan Hawke, and Don Cheadle star in Brooklyn's Finest. Keep your eyes open. Keep walking. Whoa. We're counting down to the 82nd Annual Academy Awards, and this week we're predicting who we think Oscar voters will crown in the Best Picture category. There are ten nominees this year, and they are Avatar... Oh my God. The Blind Side. Do you have any place to stay tonight? Don't you dare lie to me. District 9. Nobody really knew what this place was. And Education. You have no idea how boring everything was before I met you. The Hurt Locker. Interesting. Inglorious Bastards. Aldo the Apache and the Little Man. The German's nickname for me is The Little Man. Precious, based on the novel Push by Sapphire. And I don't want you to sit there and judge me, Miss Weiss. You shut up and you let him abuse your dog. A serious man. I think it's time that we start talking about a divorce. Up. So long, boys! And up in the air. This is the boat. This is you. You want to be in the boat? Yeah. Alone. Okay, I wouldn't have said it three weeks ago. I'm saying they're going to vote for the Hurt Locker. You? I am going to say that they're going to vote for Avatar. Oh, you I do? Think, okay. I think that I know three weeks ago you probably would have agreed yeah, with me. Yeah, in fact, I did. I think it shifted a little. I think in the last three weeks, the Hurt Locker has won enough awards, in addition to everything else that's won the last 18 months on the festival circuit, the rest of it, it's won the Producers Guild of America Award. That's an overlap body, I think, yeah, with yeah. a lot of the Oscar voters. It just feels like the winds have shifted. And somehow this, you know, having this broad list of 10 this year instead of five nominees may allow the Academy to just say, okay, look, you know, we're, we're it, recognizing it, a big group, but I think we're going to give it to the Hurt Locker. And, and it's interesting because that would be the, the lowest grossing movie ever to win a Best Picture Oscar, whereas 
Um, Avatar, obviously, the, the highest grossing yeah, movie right. of all time okay, anywhere so, in the universe. So I, I think that Avatar, in the end, you know, maybe it's cynical of me, and I know that 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 Hollywood is a very you know high-minded and idealistic place, <laughs> you know, devoted you know. to artistic quality above all. But I do think that the money that Avatar has made, the fact that it is a big, hugely globally successful, and also critically acclaimed, yeah, uh, 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 including by the two of us, yeah. movie is, is gonna win out in the end. No, by I think no, it's already. I think Hollywood's gonna think it's already made. It. It's two billion hurt locker. That's right. All right, but what about the dark horse scenario? No, you know, there's some I don't people buy say, that. You know, Inglorious Bastards could sneak up the no. middle if there's a split. No, I, no. I, what do I think of that? I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't either. But okay. worth mentioning. Make sure to go to our website and fill out your own ballot. The voting is now open and it closes on March 6th. You can win a 46-inch Sony Bravia HD TV or a Sony Blu-ray player and a 25-pack of Blu-ray movies. You just have to outpick the critics. Go to atthemoviestv.com for a complete list of rules and to see our picks in all the categories. Coming up next, a priceless art collection and two very different dysfunctional families. Three provocative true stories you might want to check out. you and all this good stuff. These are not people who are concerned about the art. These are people who are concerned about money. Culture has become big business. Culture is an industry. It's about who controls $25 billion worth of art. It was foreign art. And these people, these vandals, stepped in and took it away from me. We've got three new documentaries for you. That was a scene from The Art of the Steel. And Tony, this is Don Argett's documentary about the struggle for control of this priceless Philadelphia art collection. Yes, the Barnes, the Barnes Foundation, which a group of moneyed interests in Philadelphia um, are trying to bring into the city and away from the foundation that's housed it for uh, 75 years. So for you? Uh, for me, rent it. I think it's a really interesting story, um, but I think it's just too black and white. I think there are complicated issues that this movie explores, but it tries to turn it into a kind of a story of heroes and villains and, 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 and overdoes the sort of the crime story. Aspects it's of it. it's definitely mm, went in with an agenda, or at least it came out with an agenda. It's it's a bit one-sided. I say see it though. I okay. think I think it's gripping. <laughs> All right. Next up, Prodigal Sons. This movie was directed by Kimberly Reed, and it's a sort of autobiographical story. Kimberly Reed used to be named Paul and was the uh, the star quarterback of her then his high school football team in Helena, Montana. A picture of her and I at a dance freshman in high school. All the girls that they were all upset because he asked me and not them because they all had crushes. I love the setup of this, where she, where you don't know for like for five or ten minutes at least that this woman who's narrating the story about going back to her 20th high school reunion is was in fact you know a male back then and is now transgender. I, right? I think yeah. I say see this one because yes. it's such an interesting portrait of of, of a family, also her brother um, who's suffering from a, a brain injury who has a very interesting secret in his own background. Yes, it's yeah, we, we don't want to give that away too, but no, this is definitely the best of the three. I think I say okay. see it. All right, and sticking with dysfunctional families. October country. When something's done at home, it's a cycle and it's through generation through generation until somebody comes along to break it and say, I'm not going to be like that. So, Tony, this is a video diary of a profoundly messed up upstate New York family. It brings up an interesting question about how voyeuristic is too voyeuristic well, in this kind of thing. Because I, I bought it with Prodigal Sons. This one I resisted. I say skip it. No, I say I say see it. I think that that there are, there are some flaws in it. But this also is one of the directors. It's directed by Michael Palmieri and, and Donald Mosher. And this is Mosher's family, who he's photographed and he's written about. And and part of it is that that he knows these people well and they're comfortable with him. And there's a, a feeling of real intimacy and compassion. And there's also just heartbreakingly sad Heartbreaking. Stuff. No, it's grim. But I, th I felt like there was that performance element that it makes me uncomfortable with some documentaries. I didn't buy it. So I like Coming that. up next, can't decide what to see in theaters? Stay tuned for Bonnie Free to See. You realize how serious this is getting, don't you? Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by... Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. Okay, time for my three to see the envelope, please. Number three, The Crazies, the remake of the 1973 George A. Romero thriller about a biological plague that is messing things up in a small town. Number two, Prodigal Sons, Kimberly Reed's documentary in which Reed returns to Helena, Montana for her 20th high school reunion. Here's the hitch. 
Back then, everybody knew her as a him. And number one, The Ghost Writer, about a writer helping a shady British ex-prime minister with his memoirs. It was a fine cast working in peak form, including Ewan McGregor, Olivia Williams, and Pierce Brosnan. Good yeah, film. Yeah, I really like The Ghost Writer. Very smart, sneaky, sly movie, and, and a, a lot of fun. Yeah, and yeah, the actors are good. really up to the level. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Well, that's it for now. We'll leave you with a recap of this week's show. Remember, the voting is now open for our Outpick the Critics contest. Go to atthemoviestv.com to enter your ballot today. Join us next week for reviews of Richard Gere, Don Cheadle, and Ethan Hawke in Brooklyn's Finest. And until then, we'll be at the movies.